And as we see oil above 100 US dollars a barrel, let's bring in Sadad Al Hassani. He's the founder of Hassani Energy and a former EVP of Saudi Aramco, joining us from Dharan in Saudi Arabia. And Sadad, thank you as always for joining us today. I thought we could begin on the situation in Europe, which continues to buy Russian oil. Are we edging closer towards an EU ban on Russian imports, or would that be too self-destructive in your view? Well, good morning, Dan. No, it would definitely be self-destructive. It makes no sense at all. Uh, there are no replacements. And the worst case is the gas. The gas volumes that uh, Europe is consuming just aren't available, neither as LNG nor as pipeline gas. So it's a double uh, penalty that they would have to carry. Now, the U.S. has its own supplies, so it doesn't have this uh, problem. And the U.K. imports from the U.S., but uh, Germany and Poland and much of Eastern Europe and Western Europe do depend on Russia. Uh, this is a self-inflicted problem. And then on top of that, you have all of these voluntary sanctions. It makes no sense at all. Uh, it's, uh, it's cutting your nose to spite your face. So are there any viable alternatives to this Russian dependency? How does Europe solve this crisis? Well, the crisis uh, could have been solved a long time ago and still can be solved. Um, the, the requirements and negotiated requirements are not to escalate the violence on both sides. Uh, it's to sit down and start coming to some uh, negotiated solution. I don't think the people of Ukraine were given any choice in this war. Uh, yes, uh, the leadership uh, thought they could go ahead and maybe contain the Russian incursions, and they were encouraged to do that. But, uh, you know, this is the last uh, Ukrainian man standing while the uh, NATO and the U.S. are watching. Uh, I don't think this is the solution. Violence will not work. We've seen this in the Middle East. Uh, you've got to negotiate a settlement. And uh, I'm sure there's middle ground that can be found by both sides. It's not oil, it's not gas. That's right. It's, uh, yeah. I mean, that's right. And we continue to look at those negotiations taking place, yielding little fruit at this point. But Sadad, to your point regarding the Middle East, what role do you think this region and OPEC can actually play in replacing any lost Russian barrels? This is something that Aramco executives were asked about on the earnings call after releasing results earlier on in the week. It's certainly something that the Middle East is looking at, but also a very complicated situation here. Well, absolutely. Uh, OPEC and Saudi Arabia in particular have always been committed to secure and stable supplies of energy for the whole world. Uh, this has been the whole mission of the OPEC and OPEC plus uh, agreements. Um, the Aramco people are doing a fabulous job at trying to maintain operations under very difficult circumstances. You know, our neighbors in Iran uh, absolutely don't want to see this uh, go forward. Can you imagine giving nuclear weapons to people who are out there blowing away ships in the seas and attacking oil facilities? I think Aramco and Saudi Arabia are definitely committed to security and stability of energy supplies, but the problem is not here. It's not in OPEC, it's across the Gulf. That's right, and it makes it even more complicated when we have the United States also looking to tap into perhaps Iranian supplies as it tries to put together a JCPOA 2.0. Um, Sadat, with regards to what we've seen from Saudi Arabia this week, the country saying that it wouldn't be held responsible for any supply disruption after this latest Houthi attack on Aramco facilities. What does that messaging from Saudi Arabia signal in your view, particularly in this extremely sensitive market where we see Brent crude on the cusp of 120 US dollars a barrel. Well, yeah, I think our leadership is saying this is a collective responsibility. It's not just a Saudi responsibility or even an OPEC responsibility. Our friends in Abu Dhabi and Kuwait and Qatar, everybody's doing their best, but uh, this is at the end of the day, a commodity that serves a whole global economy. And so everybody has to do their part. And, uh, you know, uh, Iran wants to close off the Arabian Gulf. They want to close off the Red Sea. How do you contain uh, that? How do you maintain a trade and traffic uh, from the Far East to Europe or even from the Middle East to our clients all over the world if somebody's out there disrupting the shipping, let alone our facilities? 
So it's a collective mm -hmm. responsibility, and I think that's what our leadership was trying to highlight. And said, so just quickly, I want an oil man's perspective, an expert's view on this. How sustainable are prices at 120 USD? Uh, look, uh, prices were depressed in 2021 and 2020. They were about $42 Brent in 2020, $71 in, in 2021. Now we're looking easily at over $100 for the balance of 2022 and probably into the next couple of years beyond that. So, so these prices are reflecting the realities that market is up. There's a security of supply premium. There's a... Uh, <laughs> There's a security issue in general premium. And so we're looking at uh, probably $105, $110, unfortunately, for 2022. This is not an OPEC's interest. This is not in the producer's interest because it damages the global economy, damages demand. But uh, we can't control the events beyond our region. Certainly a lot happening in the oil patch, Sadat, and perhaps no relief in sight. We appreciate the conversation today. Thank you so much for joining me. That's Sadat Hosseini there from Hosseini Energy.